share first and I'm going to sit in the back and judge the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and actually I get to come up and tell you the real truth when she's done. So. <laughs> Thank God for his humor. I was just going to start bawling. <laughs> <laughs> I was too, but I covered it with humor. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Um, I've been walking up and down the hall a little bit, just praying, and I'm going to probably start crying. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, just to know how much um, CODA for me has changed my life and um, saved my life, um, kept me alive, kept me away from uh, addictions, which is where I started my recovery. And I'm knowing that you are all here, that everybody that is also joining us virtually, uh, we are one big family. Oh, you know, I, you know, one of the things with with COVID and with Zoom and all of that, it, it's like it made our Coda community so much closer and connected. Um, you know, there we really don't have any borders at all uh, between us, which is is such a gift. Uh, such a gift. So I have all these notes. Let's see what I do with them. <laughs> but so what I what I wanted to start out with, just kind of a, a funny story. I was trying to think of, you know, what I wanted to share and, you know, besides sharing on the, uh, you know, the serenity and the strength and the hope, you know, which is the um, – part of what this whole convention is about. Um, I thought I'd give you a short version of kind of how I got here. And uh, this started in 1982, and probably about uh, June, I think it was. But I was at an uh, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. There was a place in Phoenix that was called the Dome. It was just a big building. Um, where uh, they would have 12-step meetings. And uh, a girlfriend of mine had um, kind of taken me into this AA meeting. And so I'm sitting there with her, and I'm dressed in, so this is who I was. I'm dressed in tube top, bib overalls, and um, <laughs> flip-flops, and my hair, you know, I was this hippie chick. So um, <laughs> in all my glory, you know, at, at age 28. <laughs> And uh, and so I look up, and, and my friend Carol says, oh, there's my friend Ken up there. He was sitting up on these stairs because there wasn't any place else to sit. And, and uh, I went, oh, okay, you know. And so part of what took place in that little transaction um, <laughs> was that Ken saw this cute little hot mess, <laughs> said, I love that hot mess. <laughs> I'm going to go meet her. <laughs> Came down and uh, and this little hot mess fell in love with him and uh, of course it, you know we didn't even know what love was at that point but uh, you know that so that started our first introduction to each other and um, I could go on to the rest of the story but that I had to revisit my addiction one more time before I came back in and um, and then Ken and I started dating. Shortly after that, which they're not supposed to do, but we did, because <laughs> we were two hot messes. 
Hey. hey. <laughs> so out of that, out of that, Coda was born. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> Very short version. <laughs> um, but truly, after, you know, once I got into uh, recovery, it took me a number of times to stay in recovery. And I tried Alcoholics Anonymous three times, finally stayed by the third time. I tried every denomination of church that was in Phoenix, Arizona every sports outlet that was in Phoenix, because I was an athlete, and so any sports things that were out there, all trying to stay clean and sober, because what would happen is if I didn't use something to medicate myself, all the feelings around my childhood trauma would start to come up. And I didn't know what to do with it, didn't know how to deal with it. I started drinking and using when I was 11 years old, Um, It was very early, and so all I knew was how to survive and how to get through life was through chemicals, um, basically. I also had a few other, I had an eating disorder and a few other addictions that were in the mix, but that the chemical addiction definitely was um, my primary addiction to make sure that I stayed numbed out. That was my goal, is just to stay numb. So I wouldn't have any big feelings come up at all. And, and so when I got, once I, by the grace of God, stayed the, the third time in, um, you know, Ken and I, we, were, we uh, had started our relationship. We knew that there was something there between us that was, um, besides being a hot mess, um, <laughs> that we were connected with each other. And so because I was a runner in relationships, if any relationship got hard, I was out the door. I didn't do that in this relationship. Um, I knew there was something that I wanted to stay and fight for, um, basically. We ended up, um, I went into um, therapy. Ken was working at a treatment center that treated codependents and I had uh, gone into a, uh, they had a like men's and women's aftercare group that was going on, and a woman named Pia was running the, the uh, women's group. And so they said, because Ken was working out there, I could go into these groups for free and, you know, just uh, could maybe get some help. And uh, they saw me coming. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> I think it was the second meeting that I had gone to, and I was finally willing to share a little bit. And so I started sharing, (laughs) and uh, God bless Pia. She came up and she says, Honey, I think you need a little bit more help. (laughs) (laughs) Gave me a name of a therapist who, uh, her name was was Donna. She actually ended up being on the first CODA board. And... um, But she was the one who walked me through my codependence. She understood it. She was in recovery from addictions as well. So there was a lot I had in common with her. And um, we started going through uh, a lot of the, what would be the step work, um, you know, only therapeutically with her because there wasn't any place to go to. You know, I wasn't an adult child of an alcoholic. So ACA, al you know, some of the other programs just didn't fit for me um, in that. And so um, I just kept going to my meetings. I was sharing with somebody earlier today. I had a women's meeting that didn't care if I talked about codependence. Any of you are familiar with AA. Sometimes they don't want you talking about other issues, like I'm doing right now with you guys. <laughs> But um, anyway, so um, I was known as the codependent speaker in my women's AA group. And so because I was always just I was I was learning about it. It was like giving me answers. It was giving me some hope. It's like, OK, I don't have to stay here. I don't have to live this life, you know. And so but it was interesting. My my first year of um, working on my codependence, it took me over a year to do a first step. And I, and I want to talk about that because that has a lot to do with, with the topics, I think, here for the, for the convention. You know, I could understand that I 
was powerless over being a caretaker, a control freak, a runner, an avoidant, you know, all these other things. I could uh, acknowledge that, accept that about myself, but I wouldn't accept the unmanageability. I always thought that, well, if I could figure another way to say it different, do it different, you know, I was still a control freak, you know, trying to control my powerlessness, you know, um, in that. And, and it took a long time for that unmanageability kind of go from my head to my heart, you know, that long journey that is there. Um, and it was, it was a powerful thing when it finally hit. It was like, oh, I get it. I never got it in, in AA. I never, you know, when I got to a third step in AA and I'm going to turn my will and my life over to a power greater than myself. Well, nobody was greater than my fears. <laughs> That was my God, you know, so um, there wasn't any way that was going to happen. So I did an intellectual third step um, for many, many years. Kept me sober, you know, but I did an intellectual third step until I was able to really uh, embrace that part of me that was truly unmanageable and to feel that, just to feel the depths of you know, what that was to me and how that felt because I didn't want to do emotions. You know, when I, when I drank and used, I was very fearless, so I denied my fear and did a lot of risky things. When I put the chemicals down, I was very fearful. It's like all that came, came rushing back up, and I didn't know how to deal with it, so I covered all my feelings with fear. So I did my, I was fearful when I was angry, I was fearful when I was sad, I was fearful when I was in shame, I was, you know, fear covered a lot of my feelings. And so it became almost a defensive feeling as opposed to a real emotion um, that was there. So it was like going through these layers, you know, it just, um, like I said, I knew that something was happening inside of me. I didn't know what it was, and it terrified me who I would be on the other end. You know, would I still want to be with Ken? Would I still want to, um, you know, do a lot of things in my life? And I just didn't know who that person might be. And um, going from that place of being able to embrace the unmanageability, that was probably the, the first step of strength for me and really being empowered within myself and um, embracing that and feeling that. Man, it took courage for me to feel. I don't know about you, but it took courage for me to feel. And I wasn't very good at it in the beginning. You know, when I found I was very passive aggressive, so passive, I, my mom was a rager and violent and, and uh I didn't want to um, end up being like my mom, and so I suppressed all that, all those feelings of of rage and anger. And but I would always get involved with somebody who would do that for me. You know, feelings are kinetic energy; they can just travel on over to the other person, and then they can act them out, and I can still be a victim, Um, (laughs) or good for a lot of years (laughs) until it didn't. But So when I got in touch with that anger, it was a little messy at first. You know, I kind of was over at this one extreme of being so passive, and I went over here um, and found out how angry I actually was. You know, I was angry at being uh, sexually abused by my father my whole childhood. I was angry at my mom's rage and violence. I was angry at the neglect and the abandonment and the constant trauma that was within my family, although my family was adored in our community and really looked at really well in our community. And and so there was no place to go and talk. There was no place to go where people would really listen to me or hear me um, acknowledge any of the things. Um, I had one girlfriend that... Years later, we reconnected for, a, I think it was our 30th high school reunion or something. And she had told me, she says, why? She started sharing with me things she witnessed, you know. And I had never, we had never talked about anything. But at that time, I was in recovery, and I had shared that with her. And, and it was like, okay, even my friends probably growing up knew what was going on, but nobody talked back then, you know. 
I was born in 53. Nobody talked back then <laughs> at all. And, um, and so, you know, while that, you know, while I was going through learning how to do that, that anger, I, I realized that, okay, I went from being passive aggressive, which is a form of rage, and went over to being aggressive aggressive at times, which is a form of rage, obviously. And I always thought rage was anger. Much to my surprise, I found out that rage is anger, fear, shame, and pain all mixed in together. It's this crazy little cocktail that, that feels insane when we're in it. Um, you know, it feels like um, something that is taking over my body when I'm in it. And definitely I can go into that survival part of my brain, and I believe that's where codependence comes from. You know, I look at all the patterns and characteristics for myself, and what I see is this is how we all survived. You know, no right or wrong in that. It doesn't work to make intimate relationships, you know, but that is how we all survived was was through all of that. And, and thank God we survived. You know, we got here, and now we get to do this. You know, and have different lives and and a different way of being and a different relationship with ourselves. Um, So it, it, you know, it was uh, such a process of going through all of that when I, you know, when I got to um, being able to then finally uh, start to develop a higher power for myself. That took me a lot of work as well. You know, because part of with trauma that you know, I was shown in, in some of the work that I did is, you know, my mom was my higher power, my dad was my higher power, men were my higher power, fear was my higher power, you know, I had, you know, for a while drugs and alcohol were my higher power, you know, there were a lot of, I had a lot of little false gods sort of, you know, directing my life for me, and I would hear the voices in my head. It's not that they were saying, you got to do it my way, you know, kind of thing, because I was an adult now. Nobody was really saying that to me. But their voices were loud in my in my head. So I had to go through and recreate not only, you know, a higher power of my own understanding, which works for me, may not work for any of you. And thank goodness we each get to have that. I Personally, I think that relationship's very personal anyways. And so how do I describe your relationship? Just like you can't describe mine, you know. It's going to be something very personal to me. Um, But with that going on, it was like, okay, you know, I can trust. So the essence, just for me, of my higher power is love. So when I think of, okay, can I turn my will, my life, over to the care of love? There wasn't a question in that. That made sense to me. I could do that. You know, and so that's that was the beginning of me starting to uh, be able to have a relationship with a higher power, and that's expanded and grown, you know, over time uh, to be so much more, you know. Although I don't know that you can get bigger than love, but <laughs> but I guess in the expressions of it, um, you know, there is so much more, you know. And so then it was it was much easier for me to approach my steps from a place of uh, healthy shame as opposed to that toxic shame. You know, the, for me, all the, the abuse, the abandonment, the neglect, the enmeshment that I, I experienced, that I witnessed also in my family, uh, to my sisters, um, you know, through all of that, that created that sense of toxic shame that said I wasn't enough, I was dumb, stupid, bad, I would, you know, I definitely did not uh, show up as enough in my family over and over and over again. Um, I was the youngest child, I was supposed to be a boy, Uh, my dad wanted a son really bad, he had three girls, and it was clear to me he was disappointed in that. Um, So I tried to be that little boy for him, you know, be the athlete and do all these different things. For him, um, you know, and so that toxic shame that was there, I had to then start addressing that and start really looking at it. So part of, you know, part of me of of embracing the strength, I think out of these three things, the serenity, strength, and hope, 
strength was the one I wanted to really focus on the most because I think that for me that is what took me into a place of being willing to fight for myself. I had to dig down deep into that place and say, I'm not willing to live this way anymore. Just not. I don't know what that means, you know, or how that looks, you know, but I am willing to go to any lengths for my recovery. And that was something that was was just clear to my heart and my spirit. And, and now that I had a higher power I could trust in, you know, it, it to me, it wasn't as scary to begin that process. But I, I spent probably the first seven to ten years being able to work through my trauma to a place that it did not have power over my life. And it, it wasn't heavy duty that whole time. It got easier as time went on. But sexual abuse usually takes a little bit longer to deal with than some of the other abuses. And um, and my father had done that over many years um, throughout my childhood. And so it was what I knew. It was what I knew in my relationship with him. I was either his little boy or his sex partner, you know, and which is just not something that um, left me with any other kind of identity. So, you know, CODA gave me my own identity identity because it helped me begin to know who I was. You know, that it, it you know, I, I am, we were joking last night, we were at dinner and Ken was being silly or something and I looked at Lisa, I said, nope, I am my own person. <laughs> Ken is Ken's, you know. <laughs> but, you know, but saying that jokingly, but, but absolutely the truth. You know, it is just, I have, you know, um, opinions on things that you may agree with or not agree with. I'm sure any of you that was at the conference over, you know, this past week probably got to experience all those fun things (laughs) of having different opinions and working through those. But isn't that wonderful? We can have a voice, you know. Um, You know, my job is just to be clean about it, you know. And so, you know, that for me, what that means is that I can share my truth without any shame, blame, judgment, criticism, analyzing, without putting you down in any way. I can just have my truth and be clean and clear about it. And, and, and it doesn't matter if somebody agrees with it now. Would I like, if I'm going to be honest, would I like people to agree, of course, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it's okay if you don't. It's okay if you don't, you know. And so that is a gift that, that comes out of recovery too. You know, I'm, I'm still that, you know, I don't think we ever arrive in any of this. Um, you know, I am going to be 70 years old this year. I've never been 70. <laughs> I just celebrated 41 years clean and sober. I mean... And I've been working on my codependence recovery for 39 years. So, you know, it's... And I will tell you, I will be working on my codependence recovery for another however many years it is because I'm always evolving and changing. So I've never shown up being me as I am today. I, you know, that wasn't there a week ago or even a month ago, or last year, you know, every experience, I think, changes us. And so that evolution is always happening. So, you know, what CODA gives me is a way to do that gracefully, and a way to do that spiritually, and a way to do that in, in, um, in an empowered uh, place. Um, you know, I get to experience, you know, true serenity. I remember when I first got got sober, I had asked my sponsor, I said, you know, what does serenity mean? Because I really had no clue, um, if for any of you who relate to that. Um, and she just said, you know, stick around. You'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll figure it out. You know, there were no answers there. <laughs> but today, what, what for me, you know, in, in looking at emotions, I think pure joy is the peace and serenity we experience when we are in the present moment, right here, right now. And I'm not, you know, fear takes me way out in the future, 
you know, so I see it all as fantasy. It hasn't happened yet. And that toxic shame keeps me in my past. So when I'm in the fear of the shame happening again today, I'm just bouncing back and forth between the, you know, future and the past. And I miss out on today. So for me, pure joy is that peace and serenity I experience when I'm in the present moment. And I always know, like right here, right now, even though I'm, my stomach's still a little nervous um, while I'm up here talking, right here, right now, I know I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm with loving people. You know what I mean? It, it is like there is no harm right here, right now. And I think for me, every time that I have experienced that, I have healing. Because I believe that at that moment I am at one with my higher power. Um, I am integrated with, you know, that loving self-parent, my adult, my child. You know, it's like the whole of me then is here, and I'm able to share that with you. So it's a it's a powerful thing. Um, you know, I know for me sometimes, you know, I like using breath. And so sometimes just doing, you know, I, you know, with my sponsees, I'll say, breathe down to your toes and back. Now, we can't do that, but visualize it. <laughs> you know, breathe down to your toes and back and just let your body be filled with it. Be filled with breath. You know, I think that is life manna that, you know, when we get that breath, we, you know, we are oxygenated. Our bodies work better. Our minds work better. We're connected. Um, and we're in the present moment. You know, one of the gifts of codependence recovery is I have more present moments than not today. I mean, I don't think anybody can stay there 100%, you know, not a human being anyways. Um, you know, but I, I kind of look at with recovery. If I'm, do, if I'm able to stay in my, the, you know, serenity of my recovery 80 to maybe 90%, that's a really good day. Um, then I'm doing good. You know, those other times keep me humble. You know, I mean, I could list off a whole lot of things that I'm working on right now. <laughs> that, you know, there's just, there's always going to be something that is there in life situations in order to deal with. Um, but CODA gives us a way to do that. The steps give us a way to do that. You know, the, with the, um, Back to the steps with, you know, like doing a, a four step. I, you know, I have, I would say my initial four step that I did in my other program was more shame based. That makes sense? So, yeah, I did this and I did this and I did this and yeah, I'm a horrible person. Look at all these things I did. You know, well, toxic shame is not humility. Toxic shame is humiliation, and it's part of the disease, and all it does is keep me stuck. You know, and so being able to do a four-step, you know, healthy shame is, you know, what I've been taught anyways, is that we have an ability to be humble and have humility, know that we're a human being, we make mistakes, um, so when I, for me, when I can do a four step or, or a, or a 10 step, you know, anytime I'm looking at my behavior, when I can do that from that sense of humility and humbleness that I make mistakes, then I can heal from it. If I'm beating myself up for the mistakes I made, I'm just in that disease cycle, you know, that takes place and, and I don't move anywhere. It just feels miserable, uh, inside and, and so it, it made a difference when I started moving into that. And it took me a while. Like I said, the first seven to ten years probably for me were the hardest of my recovery. One of, of just because all those feelings that were going on and dealing with the trauma and, and my family, um, family of origin, not my children and kin, but my family of origin just kind of went nuts when... My maiden name's Nutter, so that makes sense. <laughs> Had to throw that one in there. But, but they, they really um, were so terrified because one of my sisters had come to a CODA meeting, and I was sharing about the incest, and she went home and told my parents about it. And um, it's like, you know, you can only imagine everything that uh, took place after that point. 
So it, my recovery during that time was was kind of dealing with this family who was just um, outrageous in their their um, abuse around me, even doing recovery, and that somehow this was a cult and you know all this kind of stuff. Ken was the head of it, or no? <laughs> no, at that time Coda wasn't around, so. <laughs> But um, but they thought my therapist was brainwashing me. I, you know, I don't know if you, any of you have had some of those experiences. But my, my family was a sick family. And so they reacted in the ways that they were trying to keep themselves safe, you know, without any judgment in that. They were doing all they knew how to do. Um, and it made it that much more clear to me on how, what kind of dysfunction I came out of. Because what they were doing was not anything new. That was the same thing they were doing while I was growing up. Um, even they got my aunts and uncles involved, which are also dysfunctional. They all came out, you know, codependence is intergenerational. You know, until somebody shows up and says, I'm stopping this cycle, the cycle continues. You know, either the same or the opposite extreme. And 180 degrees from sick is still sick. You know, so you know, whichever way that, that happens in there. And so my family was just doing all they knew how to do, and I had to get to that place of being able to forgive them and to let it go, to not excuse the act, um, but to be able to do true spiritual forgiveness for me. And, and I had read somewhere in a, somebody's actual doctorate's dissertation that, um, and I won't go into too much about that because this is CODA, but basically an old Aramaic word for forgiveness meant to untie. And I could do that. I could emotionally untie. I could see that as forgiveness, you know, and be able to let that go, not be, you know, giving them playtime in my head, uh, intervening on those thoughts, backing them off, telling myself the truth about myself, even if that day all I could say was, I am okay right here, right now. God loves me how I am. You know, if that was the only thing I could tell myself that day, that's what I would do. But that strength kept building up inside of me. That empowerment kept building up inside of me. And so as I was able to do one really challenging thing, you know, in, in my codependence recovery, it gave me the strength and the hope to be able to move to the next one and then to the next one. You know, I, I personally have experienced my recovery that it's all been in layers. You know, it took 365 days over 18, 19 years of my life to create it all. You know, it's not going to overturn overnight just because I have knowledge, you know. And so it's kind of gone through these layers and it's at times felt like I was working on the same thing over and over and over again. I don't know if any of you have felt that. Um, but it was at deeper levels, and I finally got that. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm approaching this a little bit differently this time around. You know, I'm not so reactive while I'm approaching it. I'm getting more awareness. I'm getting more clarity. I'm understanding it um, in there. And, and as I did, I felt more myself. I felt safer to be myself. For a long time, it just didn't feel safe to show up in my body, you know. So I had all those different masks that we tend to put on, you know, with, with codependence. And um, it felt safe to remove some of those masks, you know. And it took a while before I felt like I had finally done that. I remember I was sitting in a meeting one time, and, and this was probably about eight years into my codependence recovery, so I was probably about... Um, 10 years sober at that point. But I was sitting in a, in a women's meeting and I recognized that my head was quiet. Now, I had a chatty Kathy up here. <laughs> you know, any of you that grew up with chatty Kathy doll, you'll know what I mean. That's you know, my reference. But I had this, this head that just never shut up. You know, be careful, don't do that, don't say that, that looks stupid, why are you doing it? You know, just nonstop. And I don't know when that happened. I just know I can remember where I was and the meeting, everything, when I noticed that my head was quiet. And it was just, it was humbling. (laughs) Um, Just amazing. It was a miracle to me because I really didn't think I'd be able to shut those messages off. 
I was, you know, I personally believe codependence is a fear addiction. And I was so powerfully addicted to fear and scaring myself over and over and over again. Or denying that fear and going and doing something that was fearless and risk-taking and then self-sabotaging. You know, one of those, one of those two components. And, and, um, but it was just such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, you know, not to say that it stays quiet 100% of the time, but rarely does it gear back up. You know, um, times when um, my family, back to their reaction to me dealing with my recovery, had uh, told me that I was not allowed to be a part of the family as long as I was talking about the incest and the violence and everything that took place. So for 17 years, I was not a part of the family. And they said if I didn't talk about it, I could be. But if I was going to talk about it, I couldn't be a part of the family. I made that choice. Um, you know, it's like I am more important than that. I knew if I went back in that family, you know, where that would lead me, and it would lead me back to probably death through addictions, um, and I wasn't willing to go there. Um, and it was, you know, again, one of those miracles that happened. Both of my sisters, through their, through their church, there was a program they were doing on trauma and codependence. Who would thought? And uh, they got help through that, and they didn't do 12-step, but we started having a similar language now. We started talking about those things. Um, Now, my dad never could deal with it. He passed away still angry and bitter and all of that, which, you know, is his path. But my mother, before she passed away, made amends to me for not protecting me with my dad. Did not need that. I didn't need it from either one of them. I uh, did not ever expect that my mother would do that, but that's part of that hope. You know, you just never know. Those miracles happen. They come out of the blue, and she and I cried and held each other. I don't know when my mother really held me. Um, she wasn't a real touchy-feely mother. And, um, um, but before she passed away, we had that coming together with each other in that forgiveness, um, which was powerful. Um, you know, part I've gone through, you know, and I will try to talk about this. Um, in um, March of 19, my first child died from cancer, my son. And... Um, I will tell you, I, he struggled with it for six years, bravely, uh, courageously. Um, he was an amazing man. Um, he had gotten married and had a little girl, and she's now 12. And, um, but I watched him go through his struggles, and I um, gained so much inspiration from him because he, had, he was so much, he said, I, I know At some point, this will take me, you know, but I want to live my life. And and so each day he would look at, you know, how he could live his life and how he could show up for his little girl and and his family and, you know, the rest of the family in that. And um, But that was so hard. I mean, I know I talked about it at a number of different places, and um, I wouldn't have gotten through that without CODA. You know, I had so much support um, through that. And people coming up who didn't even know me, just coming up and giving me a hug. Um, you know, and it was, um, it was powerful. It was powerful. We truly are, um, and I don't think people were coming up because I'm Mary of Ken and Mary. You know, I think they were, you know what I mean, coming up because they were truly loving, caring people who had been doing their own work related and were being a support to me. And um, we have such an amazing, loving community. You know, none of us are perfect, and so, of course, some of our unloving sides can show up. <laughs> you know, but then there's a four-step and a ten-step. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we have a way to deal with it. You know, but it, um, it was something that, you know, I bring that up because, you know, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. 
the uh, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, I'm not sticking to any of these notes. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm going. Okay, I didn't say any of this. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, how am I doing on time? Also, okay. Okay. All right. I can talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness um, it probably is a perfect place to be um, ending I you know I would like to say that you know recovery for anybody who is new to this process um, I cannot tell you how many times I wanted to give up um, it's like don't don't give up before the miracles happen. I remember hearing that over and over and over again, and then I'd get little miracles and little miracles, and they would um, continue, um, and they multiplied over and over and over again. You know, it's just been amazing. This recovery truly has given me a life um, because I got to know me, and as I got to know me, I got to know Ken who I, he, is a, he is my love, <laughs> my best friend. Um, you know, we have been through so much in recovery. I mean, just um, I would not have gotten through that seven to ten years of dealing with all that, the child abuse, without his support. And he just let me be where I needed to be. Not that, you know, times we didn't struggle a little bit, um, we had a therapist for that. <laughs> um, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. she would, I'll, so I'll tell one little short story. With, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as I said, I was a runner in avoidance, so I really relate to all those avoidant patterns. Um, and a control freak. And, um, and Ken was a control freak. And... <laughs> And and so I didn't do anger, he did. He didn't do fear, I did. So we had this little agreement between ourselves. So we would be in couple session and um, things would get tense. And my initial thing was to get up and run out that door. And and Ken's was to stand up and get puffy. And so our Donna, who was only like this tall... <laughs> She would be, she says her vision of doing couples therapy with us is grabbing me by the arm and pushing Ken down. <laughs> we did that over and over and over again <laughs> till I could stay, we both could stay in our seats <laughs> and get through a session. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how she, uh, God bless her. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> She was amazing, but um, we still are in touch with her today, and, and uh, just a lovely lady. So I, the way I usually like to close is I have to close with the Code of Third Step prayer, so I would just like to read that. God, I give to you all that I am and all that I will be for your healing and direction. Make new this day as I release all my worries and fears, knowing that you are by my side. Please help me to open myself to your love, to allow your love to heal my wounds, and to allow your love to flow through me and from me to those around me. May your will be done this day and always. Amen. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And I'm going to bring up my lovely Ken. <laughs> that was just beautiful.
I'm really grateful to be here. <laughs> really grateful to be here. <laughs> Actually, I'm not so much a hot mess anymore. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Is it actually, I'm not so much a hot mess anymore. Once in a while, but I'm, I'm more like a cooled containment. <laughs> and it took a lot of years to figure out how to do that, to be honest with you. Poor Donna, she would just be, she's, she's going, you guys are crazy. And she'd be grabbing me and I'd jump up on the couch and she'd, little lady, her feet didn't even touch the floor in the chair she sat in. <laughs> So she'd jump off the chair and she'd say, sit down! <laughs> okay. Because I didn't know how to do feelings, I only knew two. And one was usually induced by something called joy, but you know, it wasn't real. <laughs> uh oh. I, you guys are in trouble. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and the other was anger. So. I was trained in a family system to where, um, well, I, I should really actually introduce myself beyond a hot mess. Uh, <laughs> I'm Ken, and I'm grateful to be recovering from codependence. <laughs> Hello. You guys are amazing. You guys are, uh, this, you, you guys got, take turns, come up here and look back out this way. You, you, you're, you're beautiful. I'm, I'm, it's been three and a half years since we've had an opportunity to be able to do this. And so to come here and, and just be, hugged beyond belief <laughs> and give hugs beyond belief and, and to love and be loved is what in my world is what recovery is 100% about. So I'm grateful for that. Um, yeah, this little lady used to scare me, you know, and because I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't trust women, but you know, I'm not saying anything that hasn't been public knowledge for many years. Donna was a lesbian, and I trusted her because she was. Except when I just about ended my life because I thought she was trying to hustle Mary out of out from under me, <laughs> and I got I got pissed, <laughs> and I went in and I sat down, and I said, "You're not getting that woman. You got to." And she starts laughing. Well, I just get more enraged because now I'm being laughed at, you know. <laughs> and she, she's, and I get up, sit down, and I sit down. So she says, I, I'm, I'm happily married. I have a wonderful partner. I do not want to hustle your wife, and I'm not going to convince her to uh, leave you. But she did convince her to take a separation. And the threat of that was so powerful to me. It left me in a hotel room for three days considering how I was going to end my life. And I couldn't find anybody. I was seven years in recovery and I didn't have anybody who carried weapons anymore that I could, because I, I kept calling people. Say, well, what do you want to wear? What, it's none of your business. Why do you want a gun? I, I, I don't know. I just like, you know. And if that, that's how sick I was. Now, I'm the clinical director for a well-known national treatment center <laughs> treating codependents, but I'm, in a, I'm rolled up in a ball in a hotel room wanting to kill in my life. So I went back in and confronted her. I said, I know you're trying to do this. She said, no, I'm not. She said, Ken, your only problem is you're codependent. And the only reason we went to see her was because she had been to this treatment facility and been treated for codependence. And so she understood the concepts and the theory and the philosophy, et cetera. So I felt safe and comfortable with her. Well, my brain immediately took off with that. Oh, I know this shit. I teach this stuff to my clinicians. I'll be, I'll be through all this in about probably a couple of weeks. <laughs> and I believed it. And I told her that. She kind of like rolled her eyes and went, OK. You know. She let me believe what I wanted to believe. You know, thank God. But, so obviously, you know, I'm, I'm still here, and Mary's still here, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit today, uh, tonight, about those three words that we, we saddled up for, serenity, strength, and hope. And I, I love those words, and I love a lot of the other words that are associated with my higher power, because those words are associated with my higher power. And I believe that they are pure gifts from my higher power 
just as grace, peace, acceptance, loving allowance, which to me is an energy above acceptance. Acceptance always means to me that I judged it first. Now I got to accept it. You know, where loving allowance means I did not judge it at all. I allowed you to be exactly who you are. And, and I had a dear friend who one, once taught me a very powerful lesson. And he said, God loves that person exactly the way they are. Why won't you? And it was like, oh, okay. Let me take the knife out. <laughs> Put it down and try to answer that question. And I, and I couldn't. It always boiled down to the fact that I was afraid. So judgment always, for me, is about fear and just under the surface. And, and it's not even real. It's a lie. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But I, I did want to talk about that, that words like love and being loved, um, words like empowerment and strength and integrity and dignity, those are not only gifts from my higher power, those are how I experience my higher power on a daily basis. And because they are of my higher power, when I'm experiencing those things, I believe I'm one with the God of my understanding. And I don't have to do anything to, to, get, to get that. You know, there's no, unless you all know of a formula, that, well, if I just do A, B, C, and F, I'll get uh, integrity. Well, there is a formula. It's called the steps. <laughs> <coughs> and I believe wholeheartedly in the steps. But it does come from a program and working a program. It comes from uh, sponsorship and developing a relationship with someone that I'm willing to risk being vulnerable with. It works by developing a support system of people that I can call anytime, day or night. Because, you know, I learned a long time ago in another A program, you know, get a lot more than one number, even with, uh, you know, get three or four sponsors if you have to, because what if, what if one of them is on the toilet? <laughs> That's exactly how she put it. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, I guess I'd wait. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So a variety of people that I can, I can be vulnerable with and that I've learned to trust because I wasn't judged. Because judgment, I believe, is one of the, the darkest, ugliest parts of humanity. And no one ever gave me the right to judge you. And yet I did it profusely. And to me, there's a world of difference between judgment and assessment. Assessment looks at the facts. And judgment goes, and you're really screwed up because of those facts. <laughs> so intellectually, I understand, understood the difference, but I had to begin to work on sorting that out and just accept the facts and say, thank you, God. You know, not judge the guy that just cut me off and chased him down the freeway for about 20 miles, <laughs> which is what I, <laughs> I used to do, you know. Thank God nobody pulled the gun. You know, today that happens all the time. But um, so I, you know, I, I had to find people that I could truly trust, and that would, that I could, that that I respected, that my heart, because um, I trust my heart today. It took a long time to do that, to trust my intuition, my instinct, my inspiration, my insight. What's your experiences of my heart? And it took a long time to do that, but my heart has never lied to me. It will always tell me my truth about anything, including all of you. So the people that ring true to my heart are the people that, that I've reached out to. And have a, today, I'm blessed with an amazing support system of people that I could go to with anything. Anything. Um, and so those are the things that produce serenity, strength, and hope. Program, step work, a relationship with a sponsor, growing a relationship with a higher power. And I've been growing a relationship with a higher power for 47 years, uh, including the first seven in that other program. 
which we're not supposed to mention, but it was AA. <laughs> I don't really care. <laughs> and it was NA. And there were a few other A's in there, but I won't get into all that. But, um, and so, you know, I, I brought some understanding and insight into my recovery from codependence and from other programs. And, and it, it really did deepen, almost immediately when I started to understand codependence, it deepened my experience of who I was and, and how far I really had to go. And, and, and for all that I knew about addictions, family systems, trauma, you name it, I didn't know much. You know, I had no idea. I, I wasn't one of those. I don't know if anybody relates to that, but the room got really quiet. I wasn't one of you, let me put it that way. <laughs> uh, I'll move on. <laughs> so what, what program has given me is me. Recovery, I like the word recovery, because it, 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 recovery is about recovering me. Codependence recovery is all about recovering me. And this beautiful, beautiful little boy inside, and this teenager that is a fighter. <laughs> you know, the, the daughter would come after her and push me back down on the couch, and I was like, okay, she's one of the first people I ever learned to respect the power she had. And she even at one point said, Ken, I'll teach you how to love me. And then in that, oh, I'll teach you how to love Mary. <laughs> and wow. I didn't expect all that coming. <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> and she did. She did. She taught me to love her. I adored this, that person. And she became, actually became a family member, thank God. <laughs> um, I'm going way off track on this. Here. <laughs> no. 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 Okay. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> so, this program has taught me how to, uh, to recover me and to recover the, the me that my higher power created, which is this little boy that carries my spirit and this teenager that carries the strength and the power that was waiting for me to show up as his parent. And the steps have taught me the tools to be a loving self-parent. Instead of shaming myself and judging myself, I'll confront that part of me. So I get the opportunity once in a while to look at him and go, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Which I learned from Donna, thank God. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it's given me an ever-changing and evolving relationship with my higher power. Always changing. My higher power, my relationship with my higher power today is very different than the one I had with my higher power a year ago, or two, three years ago. You know, COVID hit, I wanted to start judging God. Why did you let this happen to humanity? What I, once I got past the superficial shaming and judgment and the fear and all the other stuff, what I was really was angry is I wasn't going to get to do what I wanted to do for a while. And I was having a tantrum about it. Other things came up, which I'll be talking about in a minute. But I still have to get through this page. <laughs> so I was recovering me. I was recovering the little ones, my higher power. I was recovering life. Because I really didn't know how to live life and a loving relationship at the same time. I had no idea. I thought I did, but I had no idea. Now, you have to recognize that Mary and I, between us, had seven marriages. Oh, somebody's already wrong. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> I only had one, Mary had six. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, she's going to go, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> No, that's not like Mary. Now, if you know Mary, you know that's not like her. But I get to tease her. It's, it's fun. 
Um, I was married four times, including Mary, and Mary was married three. And so we jokingly said we had to have six starter marriages <laughs> <laughs> to figure out how to get to the person we wanted to to love and adore. And I, and I, both Mary and I said there were. She mentioned that there was something special. I, I believe that we both truly loved and adored one another, but we didn't have the skills to stop the triggers. And they drove us apart for a little while. So we separated twice early on. And the second time is when I wanted to end my life. And I finally heard, I was ready to hear what I needed to hear, that I was codependent. And, and that set in motion everything that brought us here tonight. Everything. Thank God she told me that. Because she didn't have to. And she wasn't, I liked her because she wasn't afraid of me. Seriously. She was not afraid of me. She liked me. She loved me. She adored me. And she told me that. And for a while, I mean, I had this teenager, well, yeah, sure, right. Uh-huh. Right. There's, you know, she just wants me to keep coming back and pay her fees. <laughs> you relate over there. <laughs> That's funny. And so... You know, I over time and the work that we did with her, uh, thank God. I mean, there was no place to go, so we, we did, the, we we had really pushed through a lot of childhood trauma. Both of us had, and it helped me develop some uh, a level and depth of compassion for me and for Mary and what we both had gone through that I'd never experienced, but for anybody in my life, I didn't know how. I was the kind of guy that. You looked at my wife wrong, wrong at a stoplight, and I would throw the door open and dive in your window. And I'd pull people off of motorcycles and sold drugs for the Hells Angels at one time. And they're really psychotic people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're crazy. So I tried to act like it, <laughs> but I could not keep up. So I ran them instead. I went the other way to San Francisco and sold drugs out of shoeboxes in Nate Ashbury and became a flower child, you know? <laughs> that was much safer <laughs> than people carrying weapons and, you know, threatening to... Anyway. Um, so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about fear, okay? And I want to talk just a little bit about learning to love and to be loved. I believe, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to, you know, I've heard people talk about how do you figure out what your purpose is. Somebody have a Kleenex? Oh, nice. Thank you. My nose is running because I had tears. <laughs> Come on. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'm gonna in a little while. I'm gonna talk a little, a little bit about the, the uh, toxic shame and the, the the shame judges. And I don't know if there was any shame judgments going on in the room just now because I blew my nose or picked my nose with a Kleenex in front of me, you know. But that that would be the shame judge, you know. Somebody go, oh, he is so disgusting. You know, um, and I'll tell you a funny story in a little bit. But <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I, I I believe that fear, the, the the two things that take me out of a conscious presence of my higher power is fear and shame. And like Mary said, she so aptly put it and simply that fear keeps us locked up in the future. It's never about the here and now. And toxic shame and the pain associated with it, because it hurts like hell, keeps us in the, in the past. Always. And so I believe that shame and fear are our dilemma. And, that's, it's, and I, I really am convinced that, that the, the number one fear for most human beings on the planet is the fear of more shame. One more time, the fear of being less than, not enough, not good enough. One more time, the fear of being abandoned, neglected, saying the wrong thing, wearing the wrong thing. 
You know, I, I had a flash of it when I walked into the dinner tonight. You know, so everybody pretty dressed up for dinner. I wore Levi's. <laughs> I said that, and I had slacks up there. But I said, no, I don't want to do that. So I said that to Mary, and she went, oh, well. <laughs> I went, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't have to go to the extreme to go, well, who gives up, you know? <laughs> But I've used that to get out of fear, too, <laughs> sometimes. So, so toxic fear is a story. It's, it's, we, we know that it, it's learned and in play from as young as we want to be all the way up to it, it, it's, it's, it, it's imprinted permanently up to by about 12 years old. So when I go into fear, I'm operating as a 12-year-old. So if I'm, I'm trying to put on that, you know, we call it the all-together act. That's where you put on the all-together act and everything's okay, but you're terrified on the inside, but you're not going to let everybody say, oh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, and I like the euphemism for fine, which I learned many years ago. But I won't tell you because I'll be in trouble. Uh, personally, I'll tell you. And so, uh, so fear, fear is a, a child's way of trying to protect itself. And we know that it comes from the kind of fear I'm talking about. Toxic fear is, is human-made. It's a child's fantasy. And if there's only two fantasies, two types of fantasies, they're always about the future. One is fear and one is excitement. So excitement addicts will use, I don't know, I, I don't know anybody who might have done this, but like gambling, sex, they're all fear fantasies. And their excitement fantasies to medicate the fear. Makes the fear go away just like that. Because it's addiction, and codependence is an addiction to fear. And so excitement fantasy about the new person in my life. The, this is the one. Oh my God. You know, <laughs> what I've just done is I've gone into the fantasy about the future, is forced my brain to release dopamine, serotonin, and epinephrine. Which is forced my, which goes to the same pleasure centers as cocaine, and now I'm a, I'm addicted to the excitement and the chemistry that I don't have to buy from a dope dealer <laughs> to get me higher in a kite, and all of a sudden everything's fun. Oh no, this is the one, yeah. <laughs> Until history shows up, <laughs> and like they say, you know, they've known for years, you, you know. Once the honeymoon is over, our entire history shows up. But I also believe that the honeymoon is a way for, for a higher power to show us the possibilities and potentials of that relationship. Until we deal with our history. And I think that de you know, it's, it's a beautiful spiritual process to be able to fall in love with somebody, deal with what keeps me from loving. So one of the things I've prayed a lot about was God, please make me a gentleman. Because I hated that I hurt people. And I hated that I couldn't stop. I hated that you glance at me the right way and I'm going to say something and come out the side of my neck, you know. I thank God I don't do that today. I don't live like that. I don't think that way. But once in a while I can feel it come, you know, like a couple of people in the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> But I contained it, pulled it back. And so it, 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 fear is, is a powerful illusion. Okay, and I can't, I can't get it. It's always going to be there. But one of the interesting things about fear that I discovered that I really didn't like at first, but I realized what it actually meant, was you don't scare me. None of you scare me. I scare myself about you. I'm the one with the fear story going on. Well, well, watch out. What if they do better? I'm weird. No, no, no. Change. No, act. Do, do it differently. Whatever. Always the fear of I'm going to be judged. So in this moment, when that's happening, I'm operating for, as about a 12-year-old kid. Acting like everything's okay. <laughs> and so fear is, and, and because it was so imprinted for most of us out of how we were treated, mistreated, I want to say, 
abuse, abandonment, enmeshment, or neglect. And, and we can't carve that out of our brain, so we have to begin to practice. Well, before we go there, I'll come back. I want to say, I want to talk about toxic shame. Because the fear of shame is the one more time being afraid that somebody's going to judge me. The fear, I'm not, I'm not going to do it well enough. I'm not going to make mistakes. I'm not going to be liked. My boss will whatever. You know, my partner will say, you know, life will be, what if they, what if they, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. And it's always the fear, of, for me, of the fear of more judgment. The fear that I'm not going to be enough. Less than, dumb, stupid, too tall, too short, too fat, too skinny. And so, toxic shame keeps us in the past. Toxic fear keeps us in the future. And I can't experience the love of a loving higher power when that's happening right here, now, in front of me. I can't experience that, your love. And so, to deal with it, because their thoughts and fear messages and shame messages are learned. And they're all learned from childhood. I don't know anybody who was born a fear addict or a shame addict. But we all suffer from it. And it's, it has to do with our thinking, obviously, and, and the stories we tell ourselves. Toxic fear tells me how bad it's going to be in the next moment, the next minute, the next hour, the next day, the next week. And toxic shame tells me how bad I am. I am not enough. I am less than. And my whole psychology, subconscious mind, takes that wholeheartedly. All that I am is worthless. It doesn't know the difference. So for me, it meant I had to learn how to intervene on the fear thought. And that meant writing it down a hundred times a day if I had to. That means I had to catch it and go, no, stop. Because fear comes from that child part of me. And he wants to make sure that I, as his parent, is going to go to any lakes to keep him safe. But he didn't trust me. So he'd scare me. I'd get scared. And I had to come back and go, no, stop. That's not an option. And the truth is, and I had to learn to state exactly what God's highest truth was in response to the fear. And it worked. And it does work. And when that wasn't enough and the fear kept coming, it kept coming, then the next step was obviously I'm going to go, I'm powerless over fear, and this specific fear, and my life is unmanageable. Fourth step would always help me to get to the source of what that fear was back when. The ones that wouldn't reprogram were the ones that I needed to deal with because they had trauma associated with them. And then they fade away. It's kind of like, oh, <laughs> they just, they're not there anymore, you know. So what happens is uh, the more that I would do that, my subconscious mind would go, oh, new normal, you are an amazing, beautiful creation of God. Yes. That feels a whole lot better than watch out what they say. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, but I can, I can slip back into that in a heartbeat, but we have tools, we have skills, we have people who can help us with that. A friend of mine, not too long, he... <laughs> Uh, he's in the room and he asked me if I was going to mention this. He, we were talking about fears and the fears of judgment and he said, mine's the worst one. I said, what's that? And he says, I have a fear of peeing in public restrooms. <laughs> and I said, oh, the pee police. <laughs> yeah. They're always there waiting. They're waiting to, do you take too long to pee? Do you, you know, he says, <laughs> he says, yeah, as soon as they walk in the door, I, I can't pee. <laughs> the fear gets that strong and I can't pee. So I'm standing there and they're waiting and, you know, what do you do? Says, you zip up and walk out the door and find some place else to go pee, or what, you know. Or you pass gas and choke half the room out. <laughs> then leave, you know. And, and we, it, it, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm visual, so I had a vision of that. Somebody in here passed the gas in the whole room going, oh my God. <laughs> Get to the exits as fast as you can. <laughs> 
<clears throat> but there's lots of categories. I've mentioned a number of times at conventions. You know, there's there's the, you know, there's the they that we're afraid of. What will they think? What will they do? Well, has anybody met them yet? <laughs> well, we're scared as hell. They, oh, you must be they. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but I'm not judging you yet. <laughs> so they're, 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 but, but we, because this is all fantasy, pure fantasy from a child. So the they, we've got to make real to justify the fear. You know, and if I fear it enough, I'm going to attract people to me that will justify it, and it's going to go, see, I was right. That fear monger, you know, shame monger. So we have a very, you know, ideally, if we can intervene and stop the thinking first and not, there's a tool called the three to five second rule. And if we can stop the, the thinking within three to five seconds, which in thinking time is a long time. You know, we can think a lot of thoughts in three to five seconds. If we can stop it and go, stop, we're not going there. The truth is, and restate the truth, and maybe do that ten times if I have to. Stop. Because I have this little one that goes, well, yeah, but. Just like, you know, as without, so within, same world. <laughs> but stop, we're not going there. Well, but, but what if, no, stop, we're not going there. The truth is, and I might say that three or four times, and then I'll ask that little guy, will you just tell me what I just said the truth is? And invariably, oh boy, as soon as he, he, he says it, and his eyes light up, and he goes like, oh, yeah. Like that part of me gets it, and that particular fear goes away. And he gets it, that I'm not there to judge him or shame him. So learning, to, I, mean, I remember the day we were living up northern Arizona, and I remember the day this little one looked at me for the first time, and he looked at me and he goes, you really are there for me. And I was like, Phew. <laughs> yeah, I brought tears to my eyes. And not too long after that, because I've been working hard on this relationship, and he said, I'm starting to trust you. And uh, we, I, I forget what, I think Mary and I were talking about believing in things and people and circumstances and HP. And he said, I believe you. And when something else happened, and I, I don't remember what it was, but he looked at me and he went, you are so awesome. And for the first time in my life, I had self-trust, self-belief, self-confidence, self-esteem, and the only source that it can ever come from is that little one. You can't give it to me. You can give me a compliment, and I'll go, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> oh, that was nice. Thank you. You know, and today I've had, I had to learn how to take compliments and to breathe them in and feel them and experience them. But you can't be the source of my well-being. The moment I give that to you, I've given you the power of God. And so the only place it comes from, that it's interesting, I'll, because I work in the field, I'll, I'll, you know, and I run a group, and this will come up from time to time, and I'll, I'll write up self-esteem, self-confidence, self-trust, self-belief, love. What's the key factor here? And they'll all be gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, come on, guys, <laughs> you know. Self. <laughs> it comes from self. It can't come from any other source. When I attached that to Mary, and she was having a bad day, it was not a pretty sight. That means that God's upset with me. Because the moment I attach my well-being to Mary or to any circumstance or situation, I've given the power of my higher power over to that person. Because my, my well-being, my higher power... It can't be attached to the car I drive, the money I have, or how my kids are acting, grandkids, where we live, where the house is, who does what, you know, because that's all going to go away. And I, I came to believe that the only thing I'm going to learn to, that I, I believe, the only thing I'm going to leave this world with 
and that my higher power is going to ask me. He's going to say, Ken, did you love? And did you love well? And I'm hoping to be able to say, yes, and I keep learning how. Because <laughs> that's what recovery is all about. The, the, the steps are tools that help self-parent me. The principles found in the 12 steps, psychological principles, are found in most parenting books written. It's not by coincidence. They're, they force us to develop an internal self-parent. You know, do a 10th step. You know, do a 6th and 7th step. <clears throat> and write out all of my shortcomings. Um, and reframe them. And create new behaviors in response to them. You know, but that's that's work that I can. I'm the only one who can do that. You can't do that for me. Well, may I? Anybody willing to say I'll do those for you? Because <laughs> I'm tired today. No. Mary tried. We tried to do it for each other. You know, and anyway. Um, so back to these. Um, so to move out of toxic fear and toxic shame, if, if, if I'm, con I mean, when I first started writing about con uh, toxic fear and toxic shame, I didn't even know how afraid I was. And that same therapist said, "I want you to, I want you to write down every fear you have." And I said, "You got a small piece of paper?" <laughs> when I got done and I really put my heart into it, she said, "Open your heart, let your heart tell you, and be honest." Little, big giant ones, everything in between, right about. I had three legal pads, pages full, one-liners, 75 items. And I was like, holy, I'm never going to get beyond this. <laughs> 75 items of fears was terrifying. That alone was scared me. It was like, so I put the thing away for a while. <laughs> And then I came back to it and started working on it, and, and it, it has made all the difference in the world. That I don't have to rely on fear. And when I don't know, I go to people that I trust. You know, I, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm of the school that when I say I don't know, what I'm really saying is I don't want to know. I really don't want to know. Not right now. So my, you know, I had a, an AA sponsor who said, well, when you, want, when you do want to know, let me know, because i got an answer for you. <laughs> you know, he was a crusty, mm. <laughs> and I adored this guy. So we have to, we, we really do have to move into recovery with fear and shame, because it will keep coming, because it's imprinted every hour of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, for 12, 13, 14, 15 solid years. It's brainwashing. And most of the time, it's not by intent. I don't think anybody woke up one morning and said, I'm just going to figure out how I can brainwash my kids and scare the hell out of them and make them feel bad about themselves. There were probably some parents that did, but, <laughs> you know, but, but it's still, none, 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 none of the difference, it's still brainwashing. My brain doesn't know how to stop that because I didn't have the tools and the skills to look at someone and go, will you please stop? Don't talk to me that way. Well, I don't care. Look, number two, always, for me, it's a three count, oops, three count rule. If you can't stop, I'm going to leave. Instead of trying to get them to stop, <laughs> which is what I've tried to do, control them, change them. If they can just see the truth, maybe they'll get it. And I'm, I'm, I'm believe me, I have the truth, you know. <laughs> so, and they may come back and say, "Well, I don't give a shit what you think." Blah, blah, blah. Said, well, my job right then is to walk out the door, and I won't like the circumstance, but I'll walk out the door with my self-esteem intact. And I'll have that little one that goes, you are there for me. So it always comes from him. And there's a little one named Kendra, who's the sweetest little girl you ever met. Mary's got a little one named Gary. He is one tough mother. <laughs> I'm serious. 
they have fun together. We, we play a lot. We spend a lot of time playing and, and appreciating and adoring each other's little ones. Because that's what life is all about. This adult life is boring. <laughs> you know, and it's where the intellect is. But So, um, I, I think we kind of Mary kind of went through, the, she stole my thunder, so I'm not going to go into that. And, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you did, but uh, recovery for now for me has been 37 years, 39 years. I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Purely God's grace. Purely God's grace. And I would have never believed that I could have the life that I have today. I, I, I could have never believed that I'd be standing here talking with you. And uh, it, it, it moves me deeply, because you, you guys are amazing. Spent, the, the time that we've spent here, you know, it hasn't been long. We just got here late, late Thursday night. But you know, yesterday and today, there's such a love and a beauty in this, in this community. Um, I haven't felt it in a long time. And I, I hadn't realized how much I've missed it, uh, especially because of COVID. You know, we kind of shut it down, even though we kept working, but we worked from our home. And thank God for COVID. We, I'm COVID. But thank God for Zoom. We could pay. We could. I thank God for COVID. I said we. I mean, we had we had I don't know 72 boosters. I think you know. <laughs> not not really, but we had all we were supposed to get, and sure enough, right? Yeah. Well, we got COVID. <laughs> Because we went to our granddaughter's graduation from uh, U of A, and, uh, and there were 7,000 other people in the room. It was like, and nobody was wearing masks, and we didn't think much of it. I mean, you know, and so two days later, I got sick, and then I gave it to Mary. And anyway, so we had that experience. Luckily, it was short-lived. We were grateful for the version we had. But... but it also opened the door for us to be able to reach out to people around the world. I, had it not been for that disease, we would, we would not have been able to have you know, meetings. And I, I tell clients all the time, you want to go to a good meeting. There's a wonderful meeting in the UK on Saturdays at noon, Arizona time. <laughs> you go, really? Can you understand them? <laughs> <laughs> Of course you can understand it. They speak English. Well, they speak their English. <laughs> then go. And go and keep going until you love them because they're some of the most delightful people we know. And so, so it, 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 it's, 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 it's given me a life that I couldn't imagine. You know, the step work, the support system, the people I spend time with. I, there isn't anybody in my social life that isn't in recovery. You know, even my extended or distant social life, they're recovery people, because those are the people I want to spend with. I can be real. My oldest son is having a hard time with that today. My, our other, uh, we have, you know, the, the two of the three that are, are still with us, and they're, they're comfortable and they lean into the, uh, our beliefs and our philosophies, and they, they love that. One's in recovery, but my oldest son is like, mm. You know, that's more of a family to you than I am. And it's like, okay, we need to talk. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to have another one and another one and another one. And hopefully, hopefully he'll come around. And if he doesn't, it's okay because that's his journey. And when I quit judging him, things got a lot better. Ah, uh, this, this disease pisses me off. You know, it's like, Why? <laughs> You know, it's exactly what he has to live, not me. So detaching with love and lovingly allowing my son to be exactly who he is is a great gift. Lovingly allowing Mary to be exactly who she is. Uh, I, and I fall in love with Mary. I can't tell you how often, but it's a lot. I, I, I've never believed that I could love anybody as much as I love you, Mary. I, we were out to dinner. At <laughs> Where were we last night? Margiano's. And 
we were sitting with other people, and I reached into my water glass, pulled out an ice cube, and pinched it, and it went right over to Mary. And, I went, and the person sitting next to me went, did you really do that? I said, yeah, you want to try it? <laughs> Because I love to play, I, I just I love to play, and so does Mary, and, ooh. and so does so does Mary. She she we play a lot because life is meant to be lived, not controlled. And you know I get tired of thinking about life. I just want to experience it. I want to keep experiencing, and because exper- you know knowledge is is basically a laptop computer. You know, and take feelings out of my life, and I'm simply an android. <laughs> it's true. I mean, feelings tell me I'm human and I'm real. It's the only way I experience life. Take them out, and I don't feel anything. And I want to feel. I want to be as alive as I possibly can. Um, well, so much for all of this. <laughs> You, we, we do this a lot. We sit down for days before, write all these great notes. And then we figure, okay, if I'm close, I'm good. Anyway, I'm going to close here, but I really appreciate you listening to me. I, I usually talk more about the steps themselves. I talk about uh, some principles, but I, I, I just really have wanted to uh, just talk about fear and shame. Because it's the very thing that takes me out of serenity, strength, and hope. I, 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 I feel hopeless when I start to feel shame. And I feel hopeless, and then I get into ho- this control hopefulness when I start to feel fear. Well, I hope it doesn't happen. Just scared the crap out of myself <laughs> about something, but these others, oh, well, I hope it doesn't happen. Yeah, but what if it does? Oh, I hope, you know, and so I had to learn how to pay attention to my thinking, stop my thinking, and show up for that little one and say, you don't need to be scared. I'm here for you. And he looks at me today and he goes, I know. It took a long, long time for that to come about, but it has come about. I want to... um, I love this, probably one of my most favorite excerpts from the Coda book. And so bear with me, I'm going to read you just uh, about that much. (laughs) Hey, it's pared down from six pages. No, I'm just kidding. Um, It's from the Coda book, page 82. Through God's abundant love and spiritual principles of our program and our willingness to be rigorously honest in continuing our recovery, and to the best of our ability, we will come to know a new sense of belonging. And I certainly feel that here, a hundred percent. We will begin to trust and believe in ourselves and that the healing of our past is possible. We'll no longer be controlled by fear and shame. We will find that we are able to respond to life's challenges with courage, integrity, and dignity, and that others will no longer be our gods. We will experience a new love and acceptance of ourselves and others. We will become capable of developing and maintaining healthy and loving relationships, and we will learn to see ourselves as equal to others. We will learn that it is possible for our families to mend and to become more loving and intimate. We will come to know that we are each a unique creation of a loving higher power, born with beauty, value, and worth. And we will progressively experience spiritual strength and serenity in our daily lives. Thank you all. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.